I'm Shivram, and today I'm going to talk to you about the power of choice in data-aware cluster scheduling. Uh, this is joint work with Arojit Panda, Ganesh Anantanarayanan, and my advisors, Mike Franklin and Jan Stoika. So if you look at uh, big data clusters uh, that are running today, uh, there are two main trends that we observe. Uh, one is this trend of big data that has been talked about a lot, where the amount of data that we collect is growing faster than Moore's law. But it's not just the amount of data that we collect. The number of jobs that are being scheduled in these like data processing clusters is also growing exponentially over the years. A couple of anecdotes that are on the slides show that uh, Facebook's Hive cluster gets 60x more Hive queries per day than four years ago. And uh, the Scope cluster uh, also has like jobs, number of jobs which are being doubled every six months. And we saw some numbers in the previous talk as well, which motivate the same trend. But along with this trend of big data, we see a trend of lower and lower latency uh, that users are sort of expecting out of these frameworks. In, if you go back to 2004, when the MapReduce paper was published, the average time to execute a task was, let's say, around 10 minutes or so. And over the past decade, uh, this has come down a lot because of uh, adding more interactive query processing features on top of these frameworks. Uh, for example, if you had taken an in-memory uh, uh, system like Spark, uh, where the storage is optimized, like using some column uh, optimized storage, uh, your tasks run in as few as like a couple of seconds or so. However, these two trends of big data and low latency are sort of at odds with each other because of some fundamental limitation on how much data you can process in a short amount of time. So these are some numbers from a recent paper uh, published last year on running a SQL query on 2.5 terabytes of data uh, on a cluster of 100 machines on EC2. So when the data was stored on disk, this query took around 15 minutes or more to complete. And you might argue that this is slow. We know that we should be using something which stores the data in memory. We could put the data in memory as well. And they ran this in that paper. And uh, they reported that the query took around one to five minutes in, in, in these cases, depending on the structure of the query itself. So then the question is, if you want to run these SQL queries in less than 10 seconds on 2.5 terabytes of data, what do we do about it? Right? So in this talk, I'm going to take a view of what applications do and then try to design a system that can actually exploit the nature of applications that are running on it. And from the application perspective, if you want to process a really large amount of data in short amount of time, and if you're not able to do that, one simple way to handle this is to look at a smaller subset or a smaller sample of the data instead of processing the entire data set. In fact, we see this trend emerging in a number of applications today. Uh, there are applications which do approximate query processing uh, using systems like uh, BlinkDB, which is proposed in academic literature, or even using other systems like Presto and Minitable at Facebook and Google, respectively. Other than that, there are also machine learning algorithms, like stochastic gradient descent or stochastic coordinate descent, which intentionally only process a small subset of data in every iteration and try to achieve convergence over a number of such iterations. So the question that we're asking in this paper is that, uh, can we somehow design a system that works well for these applications that are only processing a small subset of the data? And the key insight that we're bringing here is that when you have a large amount of data and you want to only process a small subset of it, there are a large number of choices in terms of how you can select the input that is going to get processed. So for example, if you have n blocks of data, uh, which is shown on the left-hand side here, and I'll be using these letters throughout the, to refer to uh, uh, the, same, the same setup throughout the talk. And if you want to process some small subset of it, let's say k blocks, as shown on the right-hand side, then you have a number of ways in which you can choose these k blocks out of these n blocks that are presented to you. So fundamentally, sampling not only implies that you're processing a smaller input of uh, a size of input, but also that you have a large number of choices in which you can pick uh, which inputs you want to process. And this becomes especially true if your sample sizes are pretty small or sampling fractions are pretty small. However, existing systems are unaware of the fact that these applications are using sampling, and existing schedulers are not able to exploit this aspect and improve performance. So we'll walk through a small example to show uh, how existing systems work and also try to compare with what could happen if we built a system that was choice aware. In this example, we are going to work with four input blocks that are present in our data file. And we want to process any two of these blocks. So r n equals 4 and k equals 2 in this case. 
And the job that we're trying to run is a really simple job where we, let's say, run two map tasks on these jobs, and we aggregate the results from that using uh, one uh, reduction or like one, uh, using one reducer. So let's first see what happens in existing systems. In existing systems, what happens is this, typically the application does some pre-selection or pre-sampling to figure out what data blocks it wants to process. So in this case, let's say the application decided that it wanted to process uh, blocks one and four. And then a job is submitted to the scheduler saying that I want to process blocks one and four and run two map tasks and one reduce task. So however, it could be that the machine which is holding block one could be busy right now. And once this job is submitted, the scheduler is unaware of other blocks being available and will schedule a task to be run on machine two instead of machine one. Now, because we miss locality, and because this block needs to be probably transferred across the network uh, to the second machine, uh, this task will take probably longer to execute than a case where we did get locality, with, as in the case with machine four. So the, this, after the slowest task in the first stage finishes, we can schedule the second task. Uh, in this case, we have two data blocks that are being read into one reduced task for the second stage. And you might see here that uh, I've arranged these four machines into two racks. And so there's one cross rack transfer, which is probably going through oversubscribed links. And thus, the second stage also gets a little bit slowed down because of this aspect. So what could we do if we are able to build a choice of our system? Uh, so the first thing you might notice in this choice of our system is that the application makes all of the four blocks available, or it notifies the system that it's going, it has all of these four blocks available for use. Now, given this is the case, the scheduler can then pick two blocks such that you get locality. In this case, it might pick blocks two and four. And since we get locality, the first stage will finish faster than it was before. But the second stage still has the same problem where we're trying to fetch a block of data over the network, and thus we don't see any benefits to that in this case. But we can do something better. By exploiting the fact that these applications are, uh, have this nature where they can use any subset of data, we can actually launch a few extra tasks in the preceding stage. So for example, we can launch three tasks instead of two in the preceding stage. And that means in the, when we're scheduling the next stage, we can choose any two out of these three blocks in order to minimize the amount of network transfer that we do. So in this case, the scheduler could pick the two blocks which are residing on the same rack and thus avoid a cross-rack transfer and reduce the overall job completion time uh, as well. So today I'm going to describe to you the design and implementation of such a choice of our scheduler that we call the KMN scheduler for uh, the number of tasks that are uh, launched and the number of blocks that are available and so on. Um, and I'm going to especially discuss three different aspects of the Cayman scheduler. Uh, first is, uh, I'm going to discuss about how much we can improve the locality for these input stages. And then I'm going to talk more about how do we handle longer DAGs or how do we propagate these benefits across different stages of the DAG. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can handle stragglers, which are commonly found in these big data systems as well, uh, while uh, running a scheme such as Cayman. So at a high level, our architecture probably looks something like this, where uh, an input job and the entire data set is made available to the Cayman scheduler. The scheduler then uh, decides the subset of data that the job is going to process and uh, materializes a number of tasks which are represented in this directed acyclic graph uh, or a DAG and executes them. In such a DAG, we typically see two kinds of stages. We see one-to-one -one stages. Uh, where a task reads a block of, uh, exactly one block of data. And we also see many-to-one stages where a task depends on uh, blocks of data from many different machines. And we're going to study both of them in this talk, one after the other. So when we talk about one-to-one -one stages, the thing that we are primarily interested in is this aspect of locality. And locality means that we run the co computation wherever the data resides. Locality was important in 2004 for disk-based systems, and it's become even more important as we switch to these memory-based systems such as Spark or Piccolo. This is because memory bandwidths are around uh, 50 times greater than even like a 10 gigabit per second network bandwidth that you see, and thus you get enormous uh, benefits from achieving memory locality. So how does Cayman help with memory locality? What Cayman does is that it increases the number of choices that are available 
and thus lets the scheduler get memory locality uh, by picking one of any number of these choices that are, uh, that are up for grabs. So going back to our old example, if we had four input blocks and we needed to pick any two, we have four choose two or six different uh, choices which all work fine for this job that is going to be run. Slightly generalizing it, if you have n and you wanted to pick any k, you have these n choose k or these combinatorially large number of choices that are available for you. So how much does this give us benefits or is n choose k big enough? Does this improve our locality significantly? To do this, we first look at uh, an analytical model of uh, trying to look at how this improves the locality when you have, let's say, 100 tasks in a particular job. And the point to note here is that we're trying to look at the probability that all of these 100 tasks get locality uh, because we have this sort of bulk synchronous processing model in, a, in our frameworks. So, the first, uh, so in this graph, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the probability that all 100 tasks get locality uh, as we increase the utilization that is present in the cluster. Uh, in this setup, we were assuming a uniform uh, block distribution and cluster utilization uh, to do this an analytical model. So the first graph shows how things are when you, have, uh, when you do not use KMN, or in this case, K equals N equals 100, or you do not have any extra choice. What you see in this case is that under low utilization values, the probability of locality is high, but around the 50% mark or so, the probability of locality starts dropping, and it drops significantly, and at 60% or so, it becomes extremely low. So what happens when you add KMN to this mix? Uh, and let's say we, have, we are doing 50% sampling, or we have 200 input blocks, and we want to choose any 100 of them. In this case, we can see that the probability of locality remains extremely high, even above like 80% utilization. If we switch to even, more, even smaller sampling fraction, like let's say 10% sampling, uh, then the probability of getting locality remains high at uh, even up to like 90% utilization or so. So the takeaway from this is that uh, exposing these uh, combinatorially large number of choices can significantly improve the probability of locality when you're running on uh, a shared cluster. So that gave you, gave you an intuition of how one-to-one -one stages work. Now let's move on to talk about how these many-to-one stages uh, are going to work. So the thing about many-to-one stages is that each task in this many-to-one stage is reading its input from a number of upstream tasks that were run in, in the previous stage. So for example, if we have five tasks in the upstream stage and three in the stage we're going to run right now, there are totally 15 such transfers that happen if you're doing sort of an all-to-all -all shuffle. Now, to uh, optimize the I.O. that happens in sort of these all-to-all -all shuffles, we're going to assume a network model and try to analyze what happens in such an all-to-all -all shuffle. Uh, specifically, the network model we're going to use is that uh, what is commonly found in data centers is you have a number of racks which are connected through some core switch, and we're going to assume that rack bandwidth is plenty and available, and that the core switches are like uh, links to the core switches are oversubscribed. So let's see what happens in this case where we had these five upstream tasks and three uh, uh, reduced tasks that we were running, and these 15 transfers that needed to happen. Specifically, we're only going to be interested in these cross-rack transfers that are happening. So for example, M1 produces three output blocks, one for R1, R2, and R3. Uh, but only the blocks for R2 and R3 need to go over this cross-rack link uh, to the other racks. The outputs for M2 and M3 similarly uh, need to go for R2 and R3. Or we have six blocks which traverse this uh, link from rack one to the core switch. So we can do a similar uh, counting for all of the other tasks that are running in this sort of setup, and we can assign a number of blocks that are getting transferred on every link uh, for this transfer operation that happens. Given such a setup, previous literature has shown that the bottleneck link, or the link with the maximum number of transfers, is usually the determining factor in how fast this transfer runs. More, more interestingly, we found that uh, this cross-rack data skew, or like the difference uh, or the ratio between the most loaded rack and the least loaded rack, gives us an intuition of how imbalanced this uh, rack transfer setup that we have going on is. So in this case, for example, the cross-rack skew is three. So is cross-rack skew a problem in real-world clusters? To, see, to analyze this, we took a Facebook trace of Hadoop jobs, and we tried to plot the cross-rack skew for, uh, across all of these jobs, and this shows a CDF of the cross-rack data skew. And what you can see is that for medium and large jobs, which are, have more than 50 tasks, the, uh, uh, the median cross-rack skew 
is greater than or equal to four. Uh, or we do have quite a bit of cross rack skew in this setup. Now, the power of choice that, that I described before can also help us alleviate this cross rack skew that you find in clusters. And the main intuition uh, for why we can do this is that this maps to this load balancing uh, problem of like having balls and bins, which has classically been studied in load balancing literature. So to give you an idea of what I mean by balls and bins, let's assume that each of these racks represents a bin, and that each of these tasks running in them are like balls that are present in the bin. And what the insight that we bring in this work is that we can run a few extra tasks to alleviate this cross rack skew that is present. So for example, in, in this case, instead of running five tasks, if we ran seven tasks, then we get a way, then we can choose any of these five tasks from these seven tasks in order to minimize the amount of skew that is present in the data transfer that's going to happen. For example, we could pick these five brown shaded uh, circles that I've shown in this figure, and this reduces the cross rack skew from three, which is there in the previous setup, to two, which is the best case scenario for this particular example. So uh, it, it turns out the general version of this problem uh, can be mapped to this facility location problem, uh, which is NP-hard uh, uh, if you have a large number of inputs. And so in this paper, we propose a technique uh, in our, which, uh, where we spread out our choices uh, across a number of racks, and this helps us empirically reduce this cross-rack skew. Uh, we also handle stragglers, uh, which come up in these big data setup, uh, along with uh, this, these extra tasks that are executing. And there's this very interesting trade-off between should you wait for uh, extra tasks to finish and reduce the skew, or should you just use the that, uh, task outputs that are available right now? And we discussed techniques to do this in the paper. So we built Cayman on top of Apache Spark, and it's extremely easy to use because all these details are hidden away from the user, and there's just a one-line change that you need to make if you want to use uh, this system. And there are other things, such as handling user-defined sampling functions uh, and placing reduced tasks that we discussed in the paper. Uh, before I finish, I just want to give you a quick overview of the evaluation that we did. Uh, and we used a bunch of real-world workloads, and uh, we varied a number of things. And I'm only going to get a chance to talk about the Facebook traces and the long DAG experiments that we did in this talk today. Uh, and as a baseline, what we used is we used a pre-selected random sample, uh, which had the same uh, size as input as the K-man, uh, but it was uh, determined beforehand, before the job started. Uh, so from a replay of these Facebook jobs, what we see is that we get around 60 to 90% improvements across like small to large jobs. And most of these improvements come from better memory locality and also from the balance transfers. We broke down these benefits further uh, to analyze how this uh, cross-rack skew was uh, affecting these jobs, and we measured uh, a different number of extra tasks that we run. So we ran 5% extra tasks and 10% extra tasks and see how much it helped. And what we see is that for low cross-rack skew, uh, we do not see significant benefits with extra tasks, but for higher cross-rack skew, we do see significant benefits. So you might be wondering, how many such extra tasks do I need? And to do this, we studied uh, a number of cases. And what we saw was that uh, just running 10% extra tasks gives you most of the benefits in terms of reducing cross-rack skew. Uh, I don't have too much time to go into talking about the long DAG results. Uh, but we found that uh, when you have a, long, uh, a number of stages, uh, finding out the optimal number of stages in which you want to do the sampling uh, is not very obvious, and that uh, you need to take into account how much cross-rack skew that is uh, for determining uh, when you and where you do oversampling. In terms of related work, there's been a number of uh, papers in cluster scheduling, as we saw in the previous talk as well. And the power of choices has also been looked at in terms of uh, the choice in terms of machines that exist in the, in the Sparrow paper in SOSP 2013, and also in the load balancing work uh, on the power of two choices. Uh, the idea of using constraints and uh, improving locality has been looked at in papers like Quincy and AL Shed, and uh, straggler mitigation techniques such as Dolly also run a few extra tasks uh, in, similar to Cayman. So uh, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that making systems aware of application semantics uh, can actually give us significant benefits. And in this paper, we looked at uh, how we can propagate the choices that are available in applications to the scheduler and uh, thus exploit uh, the number of uh, this flexibility that is present. Uh, using such a system improves locality and also balances network transfer and is uh, extremely useful for these emerging applications that we see. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.
Hi, uh, Bill Belosky from Microsoft Research. So the, the statistical theorems about sampling assume random samples. Right. And it seems to me that you know, you're going to get some non-randomness because mm -hmm. of the, the location stuff. Mm -hmm. But what, what seems really concerning is that if you're picking first finishers, mm -hmm. if there's a, a data dependence in the execution time of a map task, that it's going to really skew your results. Do, do you have a Yeah, so thanks. That? Uh, that's a good question. So we studied this actually in, uh, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, so the, the part about the map task finishing early, so I'll just go back to the slide that I had on uh, stragglers, which uh, shows this. Uh, yeah, so, in, so this only applies if we actually pick uh, some subset or like some of the earliest tasks that finish in this execution. Uh, so by default, what we do is we actually wait for all of these tasks to finish, and we pick the best based on this location skew that you have, or this cross-rack skew that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, and this trade-off factor uh, that we analyze only kicks in when you have some stragglers which are extremely long, which are taking an extremely long amount of time. Um, and so this is a sort of a tunable qu quantity that we have in our system. Uh, but what we found that even enabling this or disabling this, uh, we ran a number of SQL queries where we knew the, uh, uh, the error bound that you could get because these are closed form solutions from like central limit theorem and such. Mm -hmm. And we found no discernible difference in terms of like uh, the, uh, the answers that we get even with or without uh, having this uh, knob turn on or off. And I think that's primarily because these are not usually very deterministic. Like the data skew uh, thing that you say uh, is, is probably the only one which is very deterministic in terms of stragglers. What people have previously seen is that there are a large number of unpredictable factors which cause these stragglers. And so this non-determinism basically, I think, gets us away from having... Yeah, sure, as long as it's system things, it's not going to matter. Because yeah, it's exactly. It's uncorrelated. Yeah. It's yeah. only when it's correlated with the data that it yeah. really will yeah. get you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Kurt Collison, uh, VMR. So um, great to see a database talk at OSDI. Um, would like to know, uh, so to follow on to the question about randomness, so uh, the, whole, the whole theory about um, sampling uh, based on, on random mm -hmm. uh, uh, distribution of data, so you're uh, dealing with cross data, uh, mm -hmm. cross rack data skew, but depending on the uh, partitioning of data, mm -hmm. uh, you may uh, have very skewed results. Mm -hmm. So, for example, range partitioning. So, right. so how do you deal with that? So that's a great point. So uh, the skewed results or the range partitioning affects the size of each of these blocks, right? Uh, so uh, in cross-rack data skew, we are only counting the number of blocks that are coming from each, uh, each rack. Uh, what we did not do in this paper and what we want to look at in the future a little bit more is that should we also look at the size of these blocks that are coming and take some decision on it? So right now, being agnostic to size actually gives us this nice thing that we don't actually get affected if one of these partitions is slightly larger and one partition is slightly smaller, since we're actually just counting the number of partitions that are there in each of these racks. No, it actually affects the, re the quality of your results. Uh, so no, I'm saying that we don't differentiate based on larger versus smaller partitions right now, which, which, which gets us away from being affected. Okay, we'll take it offline. Okay. Hello, Malta Sportskop from Cambridge. Um, so. You, a lot of this work is about sort of trading off locality and figuring out you know, how you can minimize network transfers. And you mentioned Quincy briefly in the related work. Now that system is actually one that I think is very closely related to this, and it, but approaches the solution from a different angle. Instead of using heuristics, it actually models it as an optimization problem. Right. And normally a sort of K out of N choice problem is something that you cannot model in Quincy because it can't do combinatorial constraints. However, in your case, if you get you know, a little bit more, if you get M greater than K out of, out of N, that's still okay. Mm -hmm. So Quincy would actually work. You can just assign, you know, increasing costs and, you know, you will probably get something close to K, a bit more, a bit less, depending on, you know, how, you, uh, how, how things work out at the optimization stage. Have you given any thought to how well, you know, qu a Quincy style solution would work compared to yours? Because my feeling is that the solution would probably be better. Hmm. Uh, that's a very interesting point. We actually haven't tried out uh, trying to apply sort of an optimization routine on top of uh, this. Uh, it's primarily because of the way we approached this. We first had the combinatorial this thing, and we started from there, and then we added this sort of thing about like you can also have a few extra tasks on top of it. Uh, and because of this, uh, we never considered starting from an optimization point right. of view. Uh, but we'll definitely it'll be an interesting thing to study uh, what are the range of solutions that you get and whether it gets better or yeah, worse. We could